Hello there and welcome, my name is Ursa Ryan and if you don't know who I am, I am a very unknown small YouTuber who does Civ 6 videos and this is intended to be a pretty comprehensive guide to beating the computer on deity difficulty and specifically by winning a domination victory on deity difficulty. One of the things I see all over the place constantly is that I can't beat deity difficulty or the computer cheats or it's too difficult. Well, most of that's not true. Anybody can beat deity if you know how. It is true the computer cheats, but you just need to know how it cheats and you can kind of work backwards from there. Before we jump in, I just wanted to show you my loadout screen so you can see exactly what I'm dealing with. I'm going to be doing this on a six-armed snowflake map. Yes, I know we all know the map, but it's quite consistently started. And if you guys want to play along at the same time and, and try and win this game at the same time, this is how I'm doing it. I'm going to play as a Manatore. I was thinking about playing as Rome because Rome are really fantastically neutral. But I thought we'll play as someone a little bit different. I didn't want to play as somebody who was like specifically geared towards domination victories. Amanatori is kind of a lovely halfway house between a lot of different victory types. So I thought she'd be quite good. More, we'll talk about her in a little bit. But these are the, are the settings. It's a six player map, deity, ancient era, standard, leave the city states in disaster alone. All of the settings are otherwise the same. And there are your seeds. Not that you really need help making this map, it is a six armed snowflake, I'm sure you'll be fine. So here's how it's going to work. I am going to spend this first video explaining all of the strategy as to how to beat the game on Dare to Difficulty. We're going to go comprehensively through absolutely everything. I have about a five page word document on the screen next to me, this is going to be pretty thorough. What I'm then going to do is in the second video and then the second video onwards, so we're separating out the guide from the actual playthrough, I'm then going to play through the game and try and apply what we've been doing. So if you're looking for me actually showing you how to win a dirty game by playing the game and then sort of you copying along at the same time, then you'll want to go from the second video onwards. If you're happy just to listen to me talk and talk and talk and talk about all the strategy and the sort of little specifics as to how to beat dirty, this first video is for you. I really Really, really hope it's useful if it's not let me know why in the comments be, be nice about it you know we, we're all constructive and positive in this environment but it's always good to tell me because you know the fact that people even watch these these days are still mad to me and, and I, I do enjoy getting feedback you know to, to an extent a bit of background this guide is supposed to be as civilization or leader neutral as possible it is supposed to be as map style, mountains, sea, Pangea, uh, strategy wise, it's supposed to be as neutral as possible. So you should be able to replicate this strategy, not even just with Nubia, but with pretty much any civilization short of maybe one or two that have very, very strange ways of playing them. But this is supposed to be very, very neutral. The reason I'm playing a six armed snowflake is that A, you can, guys can copy me and B, each start is deliberately geared to pretty much encourage every single style of play. There are also going to be three different rules, three most important things that I want you to take away from this. If you don't learn anything else about how to play the game on Deity Difficulty, or even just to play Civ 6 at all, these three things are definitely what you should have in mind when it comes to domination victories. First of all, the game, especially on Deity, starts very quickly and you will find yourselves very, very far behind. Rule number one, always have the late game in mind. A deity game will often feel like you are way behind and struggling and, and, and the computer is way ahead of you. You will catch up eventually. The computer starts off with huge bonuses. I think the deity AI starts with four techs at the beginning of the game just to really make it uh, solidify. And I can guarantee you they will be engineering building Mashi Pishu before you've even beaten writing. That's just the way it works. I think the computer generally starts with the wheel and they tend uh, they start with the wheel and I think masonry, or maybe masonry is one of the first ones we go for, and then they'll put walls down almost immediately, and then they'll jump to engineering immediately. So it makes them seem like they're way ahead, and they are way ahead. But that is fine. Domination victories are much harder in the early stages of the game. You can run around with as many arches or pitati arches as you want, or as many swordsmen and battering rams. Look, here down here, swordsmen over there. Doesn't matter. As soon as walls go up, you know, a single forested or jungled city you're trying to attack with a couple of mountains in the way and some rivers can just utterly ruin it for you. You need to wait 
until specifically the modern era onwards. Obviously, you don't, you know, be pushing and getting some fighting done in the early stages of the game is fantastic where you can help it, but the modern era contains such amazing things to help you. The, the advent of artillery, that 80 bombard strength, the accumulation of observation balloons, which then gives your artillery three strength, oil, battleship, 70 strength, three range, those things are absolutely brutal. Tanks, which suddenly can travel five tiles, ignoring zone of control and getting in and, and taking cities. And then last and not least, we're not only saying bombers with their 110 bombard strength, absolute brutal machines, but also Manhattan Project coming into nukes later in the stages of the game, like build nuclear devices here. And I think thermos are over misdirection as well. The, the game is deliberately weighted from the modern era onwards to make domination victories much easier. And I can guarantee if you've built a couple of decent campuses and you stick a couple of research labs in, you're going to catch the computer up very, very quickly. And it doesn't matter if the computer is about to go into space. A couple of well-placed nukes will utterly destroy them. Always have the late game in mind. Rule number two, and if I could put this into some sort of book of war, I would. There are four different categories of armed forces in Civilization VI. You've got Army, Navy, Air Force, and Nuclear Warfare, and they are as powerful as that in the opposite order. Always remember this. Nukes will always win you the game. They are the most strong the units, technologies you can get. One well-placed thermonuclear device, especially when the computer's really settling in a condensed way, could potentially knock out three cities in one go, just reducing the deity AI into a wreck of atomic slurry before you know it. If you have the most nukes in a domination victory, you will win. You've heard of um, total atomic annihilation before, right? Or mutually assured destruction. The idea of nukes being if you build up enough that you could levy an entire civilization in one strike. It's true. On, on Civ, nukes are incredibly powerful. You, if you have the most nukes, you will win. Second up is Air Force. If you have a strong Air Force, you will win nine times out of ten because the computer cannot beat jet bombers. They cannot even beat regular bombers. I've even had playthroughs where I will take a computer apart purely with biplanes. Like, they're, they're rubbish. Biplanes are absolutely awful, but the computer's really bad at beating Air Force. The Air Force is really, really strong. If you don't believe me, to have a look at bombers. Bombers have a bombard strength of 110, right? 110. And they can be upgraded so that they attack naval and, and, and melee units pretty pretty ably as well. Let's compare that to the, the, the most powerful, you know, thing in the atomic era. Helicopters, 82 strength. 110 strength, 82 strength. When that has been upgraded, a bomber can take out a helicopter pretty much in one or two hits. And the helicopter can't do any damage against the bomber at all. In fact, actually, anti-aircraft guns only, they only appear in the atomic era. And they're rubbish. They're absolutely rubbish. They don't do a thing. I mean, you realistically have to have jet fighters in the air before you can get anywhere near beating an air force. So nukes and then air force. After that point, the person with the biggest navy will win. Now, this is especially important in maps with sea, but also on Pangaea maps. Having a strong navy is really important because if you have a strong navy, not only can you not be raided by the sea, but you can drop uh, units anywhere you want as long as there's a coastline. And just to add to this as well, nuclear submarines can help you to launch. That's a regular submarine, but nuclear submarines, which I think are over in the information area. Here we go. If you if you own the seas and you've got ten nuclear submarines around, that's ten nuclear strikes per turn. I mean, navies are so strong. The the military, actual military units. Yes, of course. If you don't have an army, you're going to get rolled over, and you need to have a defensive force. But the army is the like the weakest thing by far. It goes nukes, then air force then Navy, then Army. And I really hope showing you this on a six-prong snowflake map is going to really, really show you guys how true that statement is. The last thing you need to remember, because at some points it will feel unfair and that the computer is against you. Yes, deity does cheat. It will cheat, and it will cheat horribly. It is the only way in a, in a ridiculously complicated game like Civ. I mean, honestly, if you ever actually stopped and had a look at the sheer amount of text in this game, that is, it's mad. And then on top of that, civics, which give you governments, which will have options in the end of the game of like 50 different slots. You've got like 10 different resources, luxuries. 
It is such a complicated game. There's a reason why guides like this, people watch them, because it's complicated. It is impossible to build an AI, or certainly Sid Meier seems to be impossibly useless at building an AI that can play the game properly. It has huge flaws. Have you ever actually tried putting up an encampment with walls? The computer doesn't know what to do with them. If, if you have a city with decent walls and you haven't got like a ridiculously weak army, the computer can't take them. They, they, they just, there are, there are problems with the AI that are, are massive and obvious. And because of this, it will cheat. It is not uncommon for the computer by turn 50 to have 50 science and 50 culture. It doesn't matter that it doesn't have any of the requisite resources, it gets bonuses to growth. It gets bonuses on science and culture, on techs, on civics. You can, if you were playing with some multiplayer against humans, there are such brilliant tactics as starving somebody of gold, of amenities, none of that matters. Deity AI just ignores all of that stuff. They will cheat. You cannot play Deity AI like you were playing against a person. You have to play your own game in a very specific way, in a very optimized way, and that is the only way you will win it. If the computer feels like it's cheating and you're not having fun, it's okay. Remember rule one, the late game will win you the game. If the computer can't play the game well enough and it has to cheat at the beginning of the game, you should see it at the end of the game. The Deity AI has no idea what it's doing. In fact, I would so far to say that if you're playing on a small or standard map, if you can get to the information era and you are still alive and your civilization is still functional, so you haven't lost your capital or anything silly like that, you will win the game. You have the tools here. Between rocket artillery armies, which at that point have, I think it's 112 bombard strength, and jet fighter, jet bombers, so 120 bombard strength and 15 range, and thermonukes, and giant death robots. If you can't win the game in the information era, then, then just step back, have a think, and go again. Because anybody that gets to the information era, using those three rules, nukes, then Air Force, wait until late game army, and the deity cheats, but it's fine because they can't do the later stages of the game. Just stick with it, honestly. We're gonna talk about districts now, because districts are really, really important, and I'm trying to make this as vague as and generalized as possible, that we are not doing it with any sort of uh, reference to who we're playing as. Now, I've picked a Manatore because they are well suited to pretty much any victory type short of diplomatic, and their bonuses pretty much mean that you can build any district faster and they have improvements which, which suit them well towards deserts and general like ranged unit fighting, which ranged units are not very important overall in domination victories. Nubia are pretty pretty neutral ground. I mean, they probably have a like a slight domination links, but but it's fine. Oh, and by the way, you should say that if you want to play Dirty Victory and you haven't won the game before, oh my god, play someone you like and is someone who's suited to that victory type. There's no harm in it. You know, you can play a Dirty Victory as, as Mongolia or Scythia and you won't feel any worse for it. I'm just purely picking this because I want to be as neutral as possible. Nubia are quite good, admittedly. I was going to play Rome, Rome are really good to explain uh, to people because they're very, again, middle of the ground. But this is supposed to be very vague and very generalized to a normal, regular, bonusless sieve and a map that is about as average and, and has everything on it, sea, Pangaeas, islands, mountains, as you could imagine. So that, that's just what we're aiming for, right? We'll, we'll see, see if we can manage that. Obviously, the most important district in a science victory you see, you, you went there, you went to the science district, didn't you? No, it's industrial zones. Now this, I would put into a category of the most important. Production is the one king resource in Civ 6. When they changed everything, I mean, it was kind of the case in Civ 5 to an extent, but in Civ 6, production will win you the game. It's, it, it is just, you have to have an industrial zone in every single city that you own. It is it is just that plain simple. Attention should be paid to making sure we get up to apprenticeship nice and quickly, and we should be building industrial zones before we build anything else. There's a reason for that. You put production into a city, it begins to be able to build stuff quickly. And if we if we build our adjacency bonuses correctly with things like aqueduct and bath and canals and mines and all the sort of other bonuses you get from industrial zone adjacencies, if we do that correctly and we start getting all the way up to things like factories and coal power plants, 
I, these industrial zones can give 30, 40 production or more to a city. If it doesn't have that production, say we're going for another type of, of district, it, say we're focusing on, say, commercial hubs. Yes, gold's useful. Say we went for science, campuses. Yes, science is useful. But you can unlock as much as you want. You can have as much gold as you want. If you can't build districts, you will lose the game. Industrial zones are the most important. If you can't build army, you will lose the game. Gold will only get you so far. You know, at, at the end of the day, these tanks, that's 480 production, right? That's a huge amount of production. Say I want to build a bomber. Bombers are the most useful things in the game. 560 production. If your city's still pumping out 30 production per turn because you never built an industrial zone, you will lose. It is that simple. They allow you to unlock buildings, wonders, army, just, I could go on. Industrial zones should be put in every single city you have with the first and most important priority. Got it? That is the most important thing. Now, obviously, campuses are important. They are my second most important building. If we're playing a domination victory, we need to have good science. If we don't have good science, we can't make it to the end of the game in a technological lead. Technological leads will give you more advantages than any civilization ability possible. You can get like a plus 18 bonus with Mongolia's visibility, uh, you know, increases if you play the game well. But it doesn't matter if you're flinging jet bombers at cities of 120 bombard strength and the cities that still only have 70 strength or 80 strength because the computer's got tanks. Now we need a game immediately. So it's important that we get down to campuses. Also, and I, I hate saying that people should have a backup victory condition in mind. You never should. You should go in purely on trying to win a certain way. But having good science does unlock other victory types for you. Campuses should ideally be in every single city you've got and more importantly a campus with a plus three adjacency we'll go into that a little bit later that is a really really important thing you've got to do you have to get to plus three adjacency it's very possible if you've got a mountain start mountain starts are the easiest things in the world but it's possible when you don't have mountain starts keep an eye out for reefs plus two science from each adjacent reef that's huge that's absolutely massive plus two from geothermal fissures i mean it, it's, it's nonsense. Government plazas will also get you a very decent amount of science. Plus three science campuses are so, so important that you should try and get them in every single city you've got. Finally, the only other district I would put as a must-have in every single city is my third most important city. And this is why I quite like Rome, because Rome get good aqueducts are aqueducts. Aqueducts are cheap to build. They are 36 production base cost. It's about half the cost of a regular district of a sort of equivalent type. They're really, 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 really good. It provides up to six housing in cities that don't have otherwise uh, access to fresh water. But even if your city does get access to fresh water, it still counts as plus two housing. It stops food loss in droughts. Those things are really really rubbish if you build it next to a geothermal fissure which you know they appear from every now and then you get plus one immunity it's it that's that's two housing and plus one immunity in every city and more importantly not only are they cheap and not only do they increase housing in a city so that you can get nice big cities that will give you lots of industry and lots of science but industrial zones get plus two adjacency from each aqueduct that's huge and with a well positioned setup you can get industrial zones to have a good plus five production bonus without too much hassle it's the biggest reason aqueducts why we can we can sort of get a city from being a sort of population eight to ten decent city to bring it up to a population 13 to 14 super productive city without too much hassle. I cannot emphasize enough how important aqueducts are. If you do not think that aqueducts are important, I challenge you, play a game as the Kemmer or play a game as Rome. You will see how good they are so quickly. Okay, we're now moving into the districts that I think should be built in about half to 75% of your cities. So most cities should have one, but you're looking for good adjacencies, you're looking for good situational awareness, and you're looking to prioritize the other three districts. Science, industry, and aqueduct should always take priority. But we go into harbors and commercial hubs. The jury is split as to which one is better. I, personally, prefer harbors and I'll explain why in a second but commercial hubs are quite simple you build one it makes you loads of gold especially if you put it on a river and especially if you put it next to a harbor although 
unless you've got production through your your ass, I would never um, you know never suggest building a commercial hub and a harbour in the same city unless it's a very very specific sort of like thing. But commercial hubs give you markets, they give you banks, they give you uh, stock exchanges. All three of these are going to give you absolutely crazy amounts of gold, and they also increase your trade routes as well. It's it's really 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 good to have commercial hubs. You need the trade routes. You need the trade routes to get food. You need them to get production. You need them to get gold. And having the extra gold means that you can rush by units in newly founded cities. Say we're on the attack. We uh, take over a city in the heartland of the enemy. Um, we've got maybe four turns before the loyalty flips that city over, and we need to use it as a staging post immediately. Gold can be used to rush in new units, new districts, new new buildings, depending on the governors and things you've got going on. Like, gold is a really, really handy thing, and commercial hubs will get you gold in, in plentiful quantity. It does help with domination victories. If you don't have enough gold, you can't upgrade your troops. Upgrading troops is really, really important because it's really, really, really expensive. If we had an army of horsemen, for instance, that upgrade to, uh, where is it, to Corsa, it actually costs a huge amount. Uh, and yes, you can you can civic it to, to halve the price, but if you don't have the gold, it's rubbish. Now, I prefer harbors personally for a couple of reasons. Harbors let you build really good boats, right? Really, really good boats, massively important, hugely important. You not remember my thing? Boats are better than land army. So having a civilization that can produce you loads of boats is really, really important. It gets you that trade route. It gets you extra gold from adjacent district tiles and hint, in most cases, it's actually easier to get decent adjacency bonuses from a harbour than it is from a commercial hub, because generally speaking, you will have a city on the coast that you can get that plus two adjacency to. Uh, and like here, for instance, this would be like a one, two, three, four tile if I move my city down one to, to sort of get that adjacency bonus, so that's fine. It lets you, more importantly, build uh, naval units in cities that aren't on the coast. That's a really, really powerful ability. It gives you extra production. It gives you extra food on the sea tiles. I personally prefer harbors because it does like three things in one. Yes, it gives you extra gold through trade routes and adjacency bonuses, but it also gives you extra food and production, which commercial hubs don't. And it also lets you build better boats, which commercial hubs, again, don't. Now, there's an argument to say that commercial uh, great merchants that come through are much better generally than great admirals and they give you better bonuses and I would agree with that to an extent but great admirals are very useful you can use them as exploration units at the beginning of the game you can use them to uh, increase visibility when you're attacking uh, cities if you've got battleships with range three you punk your admiral into you know towards the city to, to illuminate it you bring him back and then you know that's all fine they also give you military strength so, so admirals they have all these abilities merchants generally are probably better but i mean yeah it's up to you if you're on a pangea map obviously harbors are not going to do very good for you commercial hubs are definitely going to be good for you and especially on a map with loads and loads of rivers and i'd suggest commercial hubs are probably quite handy but i personally prefer harbors as a priority and i think it's better suited to the nomination uh, the domino domination victory oh, here we go the next districts i'm going to be put into 25 percent to half of cities that should be about two to three maybe three to four of your districts they are not of a high priority but they are useful and shouldn't be neglected first of all the encampments. Encampments let you do a couple of things. They let you be mil military engineers later in the game. Military engineers, if you don't know what they are, they are really, 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 really good people that let you build railways everywhere, which is the most fun thing to do in Civ 6. But they also let you build um, airstrips, missile silos, uh, tunnels. You need to have at least one encampment. Equally, the deity AI will at some point attack you because that's what deity AI does. And they cannot beat encampments. Encampments are really Really, really difficult to siege without very decent siege equipment and the computer just doesn't do that very well it gives you an extra ranged attack it lets you uh, block chokeholds i think on my, this map there's a there's a little mountain range here and you can kind of push somebody this way and put an encampment sort of in the holes that the computer just couldn't attack you they're really 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 useful they also let you build armies quite well um, very quickly uh, especially if you're the Zulu but in, generally speaking once you've got a military academy later in the game um, they let you build things. I would say personally encampment should probably be built uh, situationally if you need them for defensive reasons to have them on the border of the AI it really does help 
Um, but after military engineers are probably the best time to do it. So that military academy tech, I believe military academy is somewhere in the renaissance era. I don't remember exactly where it is. It's a little further probably. There it is, military science here, right? So once you've got military science, then it's probably good to build encampments because that's the building that lets you uh, build armies really, really quickly. Um, there's no point building uh, military scientists before that point. I think armories are actually down here in military engineering. Yes, they are. There's no point building a military engineer just yet because all those things, railroads, airstrips, missile silos, mountain tunnels, none of those have been unlocked yet. So I'd hold on to encampments until you get to military science personally. Equally, airstrips. Again, you should have two to three airstrips. If you don't have any airstrips, or aerodrome, sorry, um, you're not going to be able to build planes. And planes are the second most important units in the game. They are so important. I would suggest your, yeah, your capital and probably your two highest production cities should have aerodromes. At that point, they should be ramping out bombers so that your oil and aluminium is used as much as you could possibly get away with and then that's fine. So they are really important. You cannot miss them out, but you don't need to put one in every city. It's a total waste if you had eight aerodromes. You only need two to three. I suggest two that are producing units and then maybe one on the front line that you can use to airlift your, your units once you get airports later if it's situationally useful to you. Normally I'd say just, just embark your units. It's probably just as quick. We're going to drop into the civics tree. You can see how unimportant a lot of these buildings are when you have domination victories. But we are going to say theatre squares. You should have about three of them. Of the, yeah, it depends on the size of the map. 25 to 50% of your city should have a theatre square. You're not going to be winning great writers and artists and musicians, but you will steal these eventually from the computer. And it's important to have some culture. If you don't have culture, you're not going to get some of these good... Uh, texts like feudalism where you've got things like uh, here is it, serfdom which gets you get all those tasty builders it doesn't let you get alliances hell you won't even be able to drop down into nationalism until maybe like 50 turns after the computer have you ever tried going to war with the deity AI where they've got cores and armies and you don't it sucks having a good culture is really really important and, and governors will help with that to an extent but you do need some theater squares it's really really important Lastly, uh, we have got entertainment complexes uh, and then later in the game we have got water parks. Now, it's actually better to look at water park and natural history because natural history gives you the zoo building and it gives you the aquarium building. Both of these give amenities to all the cities surrounding them by like six tiles. Don't bother to build water parks and entertainment complexes until you get to this point, until natural history, because an entertainment complex without a zoo and a water park without an aquarium are totally pointless. They, they are useless, otherwise you're just getting two amenities for the space of an entire district, whereas you could be getting about seven or eight. I Wait until natural history, but then I would say you need to build about two of each type so that all of your cities are covered by a zoo and an aquarium because it gives you so many more amenities and it helps you with war weariness later in the game. They are important. All of those districts I've just described are important, but you don't need many of them. Finally, we're dropping into the districts that we do not need to build at all, and holy sites are the first one. Unless you are specifically going for a military domination mixed with religion victory, say a crusade game, or you're playing as somebody like Chandragupta or Indonesia, um, you know, who very specifically use faith very well, or maybe Mali. I would say it's not worth building holy sites. You're not going to get a religion, and even if you do, you're not going to try and win the game with a religion. The bonuses of having a religion are not the best. You can get a pantheon without having a holy site. It's important to get pantheons where you can, but you don't need it. It's it's very situational. Unless you play a game in a certain way, you don't need to worry about holy sites. Equally, um, dams. I wouldn't worry about so much just purely because the base cost of them is so high. Military engineers can actually be used to rush these. So I would put these down as situational. Some cities will just really need a dam and you can actually combine them really well with industrial zones to get crazy bonuses. But otherwise I wouldn't necessarily worry. And equally, I would suggest that uh, later in the game in the civics tree, urbanization, neighborhoods, again, 
Unless you're playing as the Congo, I wouldn't worry specifically about neighbourhoods unless it is a situational requirement. If you have a, a city and all of your other tiles are improved and you're on 20 housing and you need more housing because your population's already at 22, then yes, potentially a neighbourhood is a really, really good thing to do. But they do cost quite a lot and they have a lot of... Uh, they take up a tile. It, it, it's just, yeah, it's situational. A neighbourhood, you can build them, but don't worry about them particularly there's no need to rush them because most of the time you won't actually get any benefit from having them lastly spaceport now it maybe it's worth having one spaceport and then uh launching the satellites you can see the world and then getting the moon landings you get that huge science and culture bonus but bonus bonus <laughs> bonus that's 10 times your thing but the amount of production it takes to build a rocketry site 1800 base production that is it's, it's like building a wonder and all of these projects cost a massive amount as well you would be better to, uh, spent uh on the manhattan project build the manhattan project and build leaks with that with that production it'll do you better than building spaceports i would i would survive you know unless you capture a spaceport i wouldn't bother with them personally so we've done all that isn't that like hilarious um i think it's probably best if we have a look at some of the texts now the sort of things you want to be gearing for in order to beat a deity game because deity will will jump at you very quickly and they will start with a big tech lead they will be over in the med medieval era before you break into the classical era but that doesn't mean you can't get to the information era before they get to the atomic you will catch up with them with a well-placed strategy first of all you want to look to unlock those techs that builders are going to be able to improve really quickly. If you've got a high rainforest start, for instance, then it's worth going towards bronze working fairly early. If you've got lots of irrigation sites, then then yeah, that's fine. In fact, actually, I've got not only a wheat, but I've also got irrigation. So I, by improving that wheat, uh, I can I can get that farmer resource. Uh, Eureka, Eureka is really important. Never forget Eureka's. In, in, you, you're effectively doubling your science by using them. Uh, by halving the costs of, of all of these texts. But you're looking to see what, what tile improvements you need really, really quickly. Now, is there a site here that I'm going to build a campus on quickly? No. No, I haven't found the mountains yet. Uh, am I going to be able to get fishes early? Well, no, not really. They're, they're quite far away teched. Uh, the mining is probably the first one I'm going to be getting, although again, you've got to think, well, do I want to keep flatland stone? Who knows? Animal husbandry, that's a four tile yield over there. There's a five yield tile over here, although gold I like to neglect at the beginning of the game. I would always suggest going in order uh, to, to basically improve your builders at the beginning of the game. So if I had loads and loads of animals, I'd go for animal husbandry. If you have a start like this, which has a bit of one of everything, one animal, one stone, one irrigation, one fish, all within two tiles of me, then the best thing to do initially is to go for pottery. Pottery allows you to go to writing really quickly. Um, it also allows you to, to get a granary, which, which helps to build that city really, really quickly. Do not focus on wonders. You will not win the wonder game unless you get a really big tech lead because the deity AI can build wonders way quicker quicker than you could ever like research them there is no point obviously writing is important to get to you know potentially wait until you've met another civilization or until you found a really good plus three slot at the beginning for one um we'll, we'll sort of see how it goes along and then currency or celestial navigation whichever is your chosen uh thing that particular game those are really really good to go for um also keep an eye on archery archery you don't want to get until you've built about six slingers and then you can immediately upgrade them all into archers and just sort of do that thing slingers are much much cheaper to buy them it's a good use for your early game gold now this is what i would call the early game the mid game begins in the medieval era uh, and the mid game changes when the industrial zone comes in because your strategy will change drastically. In this point, we're looking to upgrade all of our cities effectively. So we're looking to get a couple cities out, but this era, the, the sort of ancient era, and then the classical era, you're essentially just looking to improve all of your tiles. Remember, each city should have every single tile improved that it is working, right? If the population is eight, you need eight improved tiles. If you haven't got eight improved tiles, you've, you're leaving production and food on the table. You're totally missing that. Builders are one of the most important things. And that's why I value feudalism so high later in the game, because getting those, uh, yeah, up here, 
serfdom. Oh no, I don't actually want to do that at all. But like, yeah, get, getting those extra building slots. Oh, brilliant, 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 brilliant. The only other thing I would uh, give a special mention to is masonry. Because you need to put ancient walls up in your cities, especially your adjacent cities to the deity, as soon as possible. For two reasons. One, the deity will attack you because they're like that. They start with a huge army. They start with like five warriors at the beginning of the game and can produce them at almost double speed. They will swarm you at the beginning of the game, especially with chariot archers. These things, 28 melee strength, are absolutely disgustingly brutal. You know, archers can't touch them, apart from my, my archers probably can, but they, they, they're brilliant. But the computer cannot beat ancient walls. They're useless at it. They never bring battering rams and they will just headbutt your walls repeatedly. It's really, really, really good. Once we get to the medieval era, we're aiming to sort of go into what I call the mid game. Obviously, apprenticeship is the most important thing to unlock as soon as you can get it because those industrial zones are going to win you the game. Education as well. You should have lots of campuses up by this point. It, it's really, really important. Um, and make sure you've got engineering as well. So then you've unlocked the three best uh, districts. Yep, all good so far, right? After this point, you have this sort of weird middle game where all of these tags, like all of the Renaissance era tags, are a little bit rubbish. So go for Eurekas. Anything you've, you've Eurekaed is normally a pretty good. If you go for unlocking Nitre, that's really good because it helps you to get more production onto the map because, you know, better tiles. That's all very well. Keep an eye on your armed units. You always want to have one armed unit of the most powerful thing you can unlock at that time. Normally it's Knights coursers or musketmen you want to build one of them so all your city walls have back strength because they're set to whatever your strongest unit is but after this point um you want to be focusing towards getting industrialization this is the point of the game where again those industrial zones start to really really make it for you getting coal burning coal and burning you're just putting factories and even getting the rural valley if you can get that one you've got an amazing city this is a really 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 important one again keep cuirassars and cavalry as an idea because you want to have at least one of those to make sure your cities are all really really powerful um this is a horrible stage of the game here bombards attacking with bombards is fine but you're not going to really get much success militarily once the computer has stuck walls up uh through to maybe this point of flight it's not worth really going to war too much unless you can get some good naval wins with some frigates frigates are really 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 good uh, units but industrialization is definitely the one to focus on here this is where we're going to massively get there until we hit the late game i'd call the late game modern era onwards at this point flight is important so you can start building those aerodromes i would also get oil as quickly as you can so you can see what sort of start you've got and then also radio with aluminium oil and aluminium are the two most important resources in the game Aluminium will fund your entire air force and you want to be using it exclusively to build those bombers and oil will power fill uh, things like your artillery units and your infantry units. Um, coal is pretty important as well at this at this point if you've got any spare for battleships that's great. Um, otherwise frigates are really good because they don't require maintenance cost whereas battleships do. So flight, radio and refining are the three most important ones in that area although everything's kind of important at that point advanced flight is where you want to be going if you've still got aluminium bombers once you get bombers you can really really start to, to attack people and this is the stage of the game going into the atomic era where we're going to pick up like double the amount of cities without really having to sort of stretch too much combined arms will get you uh, a sense of whether or not you've got uranium actually it's quite often to not have uranium on a map like this it's very difficult to keep hold of um, after that point realistically nukes get nuclear fission and build the manhattan project so you can do that but you don't really need anything in particular once you've got bombers and nukes that will win you the game in the right hands after that point it's very situational if you need carriers get yourself carriers if you need uh rocket artillery then get yourself rocket artillery if you need nuclear submarines then do that but yeah i think the most important tax easily uh, is industrialization and uh, apprenticeship. Those two are, are just, oh, so good. Let's have a look at some of the civics, which are the most important things to do. Now, 
there is a uh, two ways you can go for this and i'm always tempted to suggest not going for this first way because the deity ai again the thing about deities is they start with three civics or the abilities to get civics at a much faster pace and they've got a lot of culture at the beginning of the game so they will start working on those wonders way quicker than you can ever do there is a strategy and this works better on multiplayer where if you jump immediately for mysticism you can cut down the beginning of this tree get a pantheon discover a continent by sending a, a scout out just to knock this off and immediately put down the oracle if you can get the oracle and you can get uh, a governor later uh, we're going to go down the pingala tree to grant that plus 100 percent great people points plus the uh, i think it's 100 percent um oh no each city provides plus two great pe person points of their type for instance that that combination is absolutely insane and mean that you start to, to get tons and tons of great people i i'm not going to go that way this time because it's quite situational um it requires a bit of production a bit of luck and the ability for the deity not to go for that as well so let's have a look at some of these of the most important things to go i would always go for craftsmanship first um for a couple of reasons builders and agogi so it'll, it'll come and agogi are the two best uh, policies in the early game spitting out slinger units is really really important to stop the ai or specifically barbarians from swamping at the beginning of the game and those extra builders are important because you should have remember every single one of your tiles improved i want to get my city my capital specifically to population 10 as quickly as i can and that's really important i also want to be going down state workforce because the government plaza is a really 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 important building i didn't put it in my district's guide earlier because it's just a Assumed, you should build it it is really really good especially for the adjacency bonuses just really 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 good but that lets me get towards the governor title and it also lets me get towards the governor of plaza which then gives me another governor title very very quickly i'm going to be building a specialty district probably by that point am i going to get three tiles done quickly well if i go for a builder immediately then yes and i will be going for a builder immediately because of all this wheat around me it's very easy to upgrade all of that um, so state workforce I would always go for first. By that point you should then have discovered a continent and also got a city to six pop. So early empire followed by political philosophy. You want to get that government up nice and quickly but once you've got p uh, political philosophy yeah you're, you're sort of you're into the game and you're you're sort of guessing there. Now if you're playing a religious game you want to beeline theology but we're not going to do that. We're then going to go to recorded history to get natural philosophy. Now this is the second most important civic in the game, that uh, recorded history. We need to put a lot of time and effort, oh sorry, into getting recorded as history. Because of this card, natural philosophy. This 100% campus district adjacency bonus. Again, beginning of the game, that does really really well. Now the mid game, the most important civic in the entire game is the enlightenment and the reason this is the most important is because of uh where is it rationalism extra science from buildings and campuses plus 50 percent if city population is 10 or higher plus 50 percent in district has at least three adjacency bonus there's the adjacency bonus we're talking about my capital at least will have plus three because we're going to make sure it does and it will have uh, 10 pop because I want all my cities to have 10 pop that is the minimum requirement I want every single one of my cities for a lot of these cards to work you want to be getting rationalism as quickly as you can because between that card um, in the enlightenment uh, sorry the rationalism card and then I believe it's the natural philosophy card those two will get you a huge amount of science so that's really really important to go down that way otherwise feudalism i would always recommend going down there as quickly as possible in order to get those extra builders civil service and getting an alliance alliances are really 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 important at this early stage of the game um keeping you safe from the deity ai especially getting a military alliance up if you can get one of that it gives you an ally in wars and then another plus five bonus which really helps um guilds are also really important because of this one craftsmen plus 100 percent industrial zone adjacency bonus that's huge and then i would always recommend going exploration over divine right divine right gives you a lot of military policy slots and i'm not a huge fan of that i would rather take the extra economic policy slots and the extra wild card slots and this plus 10 percent um 
uh, extra gold and then 15% extra districts is really, really good at improving your cities up. That's all fantastic. Uh, a special shout out as well to diplomatic service because once we've got a couple of allies, we want to get Visselbanken and you want to be sending trade routes abroad to get that two food, two production and all the gold that trade routes would normally give you. Civil engineering I also like because of, again, the extra builders um, and nationalism because of course it's corpse and fleets. We, we need that to kill things. Easy. After that point, mobilization is good, but it's not as important as getting armies. That extra plus seven, it, it's a big bonus to get into an army, and armies are really good at, at conserving um, resources once we get into that later stage of the game. But ideology is the first big one we want to go for, because commercial hub and harbor districts being put into one, and campus and industrial zone being put into one card, that saves you so many cards. And at that point, we want to have a look and see what we're doing. If the war is going really, really, really well. Um, fascism never hurts. That plus five combat strength is huge. Democracy, if we've got loads of trade routes, we can use it just to keep piling on the effects of extra uh, gold and we can actually use it to buy an army. And communism, if you will find yourself by us. I'd normally go fascism, to be fair. Uh, third alternative, plus two culture and plus four gold from each research lab, military academy, coal power plant, that will give you a lot of gold as well and it's a good way of using a uh, military policy slot. I, the only thing I don't like about fascism is all of those military policy slots. They are absolutely terrible. I mean, there's, there's really not much you can do with them. So that's why democracy I always quite like. All of those economic policy slots are pretty good. But fascism, that plus five is 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 really impressive. Really, really, really impressive. After that point, again, you're kind of following civic boosts realistically. New feature governance is a really good way of getting both governor titles and envoys and then going into one of these. I think synthetic technocracy is a really really good one because it gives you all the extra power. Um, other than that I think yeah you want to avoid digital democracy because that gives you the minus three combat strength. Corporate libertarianism can also be quite fun because it gives you extra production. One quick shout I want to make is towards envoys, because envoys and deity AI are a tricky thing. The deity will throw mo more envoys out of its ass than you could even think about. I don't know where it gets them from, but it has a huge bonus on envoys. It will get suzerain with most city-states, so what I would suggest is have a look at the city-states around you, pick one you really like, and focus on it. It's the easiest way. It really is the easiest way. Don't try and win all of your uh, city-states. And don't be afraid to kill city-states that you are not allied to. It's a really way of a good way of removing them from the game. I also have a quick word about government plazas because you get lots of different options in terms of buildings that you could be producing with them. I would always suggest in a game such as this, it is a split between the ancestral hall um, which gives you the extra builder when you settle. If it's a huge map and you need to get out there quickly, that's a really good thing to do. But on a, on a domination victory, the Warlord's Throne, that extra production, I think it's 20% production for five turns after taking a city, that adds up really nicely. The second choice, the Intelligence Agency, I would always suggest having better spies is really good and you need those spies to get diplomatic visibility on people so that you get the combat bonus that's associated with that. I would always suggest that over, say, um, what are the options? Foreign Ministry, you're not realistically going to use that and the Grand Master's Chapel, you're not going to have faith. So that one's a pretty easy choice. After that point, the Royal Society is a good way if you've got lots of great works that you want to shove into your capital to, to boost some policies. But again, not massively a, a sort of a, a big thing for us there. Um, National History Museum, again, is a good way of putting things in, but I would always go for the War Department. The War Department lets your units heal. So there's a couple of really good options there, and you want to keep an eye on those, especially because of the extra governor slots. It's, it's really, really good. Speaking of governors, governors, there's only really two um, that you want to be focusing on. Pingala is the best way you will catch up with the deity AI. They will start with such a science and culture boost, it is nonsense. Having Librarian in there to get that 15% increase, it's a start. Realistically though, Connoisseur and Researcher are the two. I would always go Connoisseur first. You want that culture boost 
at the beginning of the game so you can jump up to your government as quickly as possible. If you've got a 10 population city, that 10 culture at the beginning of the game is massive. Absolutely massive and grants helps you to get all of those great scientists at the beginning of the game as well. But you know, if you've got Scotland in the game or the AI is having a really bad day, it will win all the great people anyway. But Pingala, you want to get librarian, connoisseur, researcher and grants up as quickly as possible. Magnus as well. If it's a really, 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 really big map and you're under no threat of immediate attack, then Magnus is a good choice because you can get immediately down to provision. Uh, settlers train in a city do not consume the population. I would always suggest getting Magnus, but get him in a second city with lots of production and use that to pump out all your settlers. Uh, realistically, on a map against the deity, you're unlikely to be able to settle more than about five or six cities, um, even if we're really quick on a deity difficulty, on a, on a sort of small to standard map. We're going to be taking most of our cities, so Magnus isn't as important on this one. But a shout briefly to strategic resource costs for units, discounting that by 80%. If you don't have Niter, or if you don't have iron or horses, he's a really, really good way of getting armed units out in a, in a way that wouldn't necessarily be possible before. Victor is really good. Uh, you pop him in a city that you've just taken. It gives him three turns and then you can defend that new city by increasing the combat strength by even giving it uh, double attacks. I think Embrasure. Yeah, I mean, like he's really, really good at putting in cities that are, are kicking units out. Um, units defending in the city. Uh, city can't be put under siege. Strategic resources. Air defense. I mean, this is really really good you can even make better nukes from him you don't need moshka because you're not going to be getting faith amani is only really good to put in a city state um if you want to burn a lot of governor slots you can get all the way down to puppeteer which basically wins a, a city state for you by doubling the amount of envoys that's pretty good liang there's a shout out to putting her down once just getting that extra building charge is, is quite handy if you stack that up with um uh, feudalism and then the pyramid you can get builders that have seven charges which will quickly upgrade your lands and rain is pretty good at increasing the gold if you've got a city both with a commercial hub and a harbor that's quite good and a really high population city uh, tax collector plus two gold for each citizen in the city a 20 pop city will give you 40 gold it's, it's huge um but realistically until you get renewables she's not not the best Pantheons, 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 Pantheons. We're not, we can't have a quick look at them, but I would get one as soon as you can. Um, if you've got a start that gives you some faith, fantastic. Like this tile is going to give us a little bit of faith and I can combine that uh, with the early game, where is it, God King? Uh, just put God King in immediately at the beginning of the game to get you that Pantheon and then switch it back out. Pantheons are really, really useful. Even when you're not using the Pantheon glitch, which who knows when they're going to get rid of that, it's still quite fun that one. Divine Spark is my way to go personally because the extra great scientist points is, is really really handy um, but you can also get things like extra uh, production from strategic resources, culture from uh, from, from uh, camps and, and from uh, pastures, sorry, pastures, camps can give you extra food and production. There's all kinds of stuff that you can put down. It's worth getting a Pantheon otherwise you're just leaving stuff on the table. Finally, if you did want to play as a Sith who is particularly suited to a domination victory, then there are a couple of options. Our grinning friend Alexander is obviously really, really, really good um, at <laughs> that sort of victory. In fact, actually, let's have a look instead of civilizations. Um, it's probably easy to have a look at this. Yeah, Macedon, they are really, really, really good at military victories. Um, the Aztecs are quite a fun one as well. The extra combat strength and being able to build, spend their build charges is pretty good. America means that you can win your continent nice and quickly and they get some pretty good fighter planes later in the game. Uh, Honourable shout out to the Ottomans as well, who have a combination of their unique... Um, uh, advisor and then extra bombard strength that's pretty pretty good they are amazing at sieging cities um, India specifically India under Chandra Gupta is really good fun um, I would suggest England under Eleanor of Aquitaine uh, that's a really funny one if you want to just flip cities to your to your side um, Scythia obviously huge strength at combat in, in, in uh, light cavalry units being able to double train those and getting extra combat strength against wounded troops and then uh persia really really good persia's are actually a very fun game that extra movement you get from surprise wars 
is really good fun. I'd recommend giving it a go if you've never given it a go before. It can be really enjoyable and the honourable shout has to go to Mongolia. Mongolia, the extra combat strength you can get from Ur2 and the trade route and visibility, diplomatic visibility is massive. I mean, you can get like plus 18 bonuses from this guy. It's, it's nonsense. Oh, and Mapushi. I'm going to forget Mapushi. Look at that. Golden Age strength and also the ability to produce better troops when saving with a governor. So this is... Oh, He's, he's just really good. But the important thing is Domination Victory does not have to be somebody that specifically gives you bonuses to combat. It can also be just somebody who builds a good empire because a good strong empire produces lots of science and it gets you up a tree quicker. So Korea, for instance, are fantastic at Domination playthroughs because you're up there in science. Like they're, they're really, really good. Japan are fantastic as well. You do get combat bonus strength, but you also get the additional adjacency to building, force building those plus three campuses is much easier with Japan because you can just stick them next to each other and they, they just sort of become a self-fulfilling prophecy. The Netherlands, again, can use that ability with rivers to be able to produce really good campuses, as can Australia with their charming and breathtaking appeal bonuses and the fact that they go crazy as soon as you declare war on them and suddenly you've got double production. This can be hilarious. I've had a city with Australia with 500 production before at the end of the game when someone declared war on me. It was amazing. Um, finally, Brazil as well. Those Minas Gerais battleships are redonk and the extra rainforest adjacency for campuses means that again you get those plus three campuses really really quickly. But the, the short thing is that anybody can get a domination victory. It's the easiest victory to get. You just need to be good on science and follow my rules. Do you remember what the rules were? Let's scroll back to the top of the page because it's going to be the last thing I say. Always have the late game in mind. The late game is what's going to win you the game, not the beginning of the game. If it doesn't feel like it's going well for you, stick it out. Secondly, nukes are the best, then the Air Force, then the Navy, then the Army. If you're ever wondering at the end of the game what a city should be doing, should I build an extra tank or a plane or a nuke? Definitely nuke, then plane, then tank. Finally, the computer will cheat. Deity does cheat. It's just the way it does it. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to call this video here and the next video is going to be me actually playing this game. So you can see me implementing all of these rules, giving it a good go. Oh, and I can actually stop talking so much. I hope this was useful. I really hope this was useful. Leave a comment. Just, just, just tell me. Was anything you need me to go into more specifics on? Maybe I'll do these on, on other victory types. I'm not sure yet, but we'll give it a go a little bit later thank you so much for watching and join you next video for the playthrough see you in a bit bye